Hello, everyone. My name is Melanie Panich, and I'm director of the Office of Social Innovation. At our Office of Social Innovation, we have many uh, ways of approaching social innovation, but primarily and exclusively, we think about it as the practice of creative and collaborative approaches to challenge historical and existing systems of exclusion, thinking about a transformative impact on society and the environment. I want to welcome everyone today. I want particularly to welcome the students in CYC 550 Foundations in Social Innovation, a course where we take up challenging and complex social issues. It was really to inspire your learning that this talk today was first imagined, thanks to my intrepid co-instructor, Jane Schmidt, who will introduce our speaker later. And I want to welcome all of you who have signed in to join us today. This is the inaugural lecture in a new series titled the Unexpected Visitor Series, where our virtual lives make the unexpected possible. A lecture in a class becomes a public lecture. And today we have a guest speaker with an intriguing point of view to speak with us on a critical topic in the area of social justice. I've read June Finley, and now I very much look forward to meeting you, June, and to hearing you on your provocatively titled presentation, Whose Charity Is It Anyway? I want to take a moment to acknowledge Jocelyn Cornaya, Coordinator of Marketing and Communications in OSI, for her eagerness to move on a dime to organize this talk. Just a few points before we get started. The lecture is being recorded and will be uploaded on our website. We do have captioning, which can be accessed through an external link in the chat. Attendees are encouraged to submit, submit questions through the chat, which will be responded to during the Q&A following June's lecture. I would, however, like to begin with a land acknowledgement. It was curated for today's event by Jess Machado, Coordinator of Events and Programming in OSI. If we were meeting in person, we would be able to acknowledge the land we are collectively gathering on to learn together. Instead, we are joining virtually and we will be acknowledging the land where our staff and guest lecturer are situated. We continue this practice because as we are all treaty people, we have a responsibility to honor indigenous peoples ongoing kinship to the land and to be reminded of our treaty obligations. We are joining from Toronto in the Dish with One Spoon territory, which covers the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway. This treaty, initially between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe and Mississaugas, bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations, Europeans and newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. This treaty, which represents our shared land as a dish, carries three important teachings. That we live our lives and never take more than we need. That we ensure we leave something in the dish for others and that we keep the dish clean. At any OSI event, that is Office of Social Innovation event, we're bringing the complexities of wicked social problems and the systems they are situated in to the forefront. In this lecture, that wicked problem is charity, which is upheld by colonial systems of Eurocentrism, white supremacy, and capitalism. As we will hear from June, the nuances in charity can be seen from the role of politics, identity, race, marketing, and entertainment. And I welcome Jane to now introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Melanie. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad that we've all been able to gather here today to welcome June Finley. June is a talented and trusted social media creative strategist, consultant and writer based in Toronto. She has spent many years working and volunteering in the charitable and corporate sectors, growing the online presence of major brands like UNICEF Canada, the YMCA of Greater Toronto, and the Lincoln Motor Company of Canada. June, wrote her, ma her award-winning master's thesis, Pomp and Circumstance, Communication Strategy, Charitainment, and the Media Event in the Humanitarian Context, focusing on the communication strategies of We Day. 
and this won the best civil society thesis award from a Swedish civil, civil society organization, Sector 3, now known as Idealistas. In July of 2020, at the beginning of the We Charity scandal, she wrote a Twitter thread summarizing her thesis work about We Charity, and it went viral and sparked discussion among people in the realms of charity, media, and politics. This resulted in her article for Flair magazine, writing about We Charity's activity in the context of the current federal government scandal. June holds her BA in International Studies and French English Translation from York University and an MA in Media and Communication Science from Mid Sweden University. And it was that Twitter th thread that I found uh, while I was on vacation at the end of June this past summer. And I was so thrilled and so excited to see that there was some good um, high quality scholarly work going on on this topic. And um, I started following June and I kind of made it a little bit of a mission to, to try to get to know her. <laughs> and then it just so happened that we had the opportunity to invite her here today. And so without further ado, June, I'm going to pass it over to you. We're so excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jane, Melanie and Jessica. Um, and Jocelyn, all of the staff at Ryerson, you guys have been great so far. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to meet you all. I see some of you coming in from various parts of my life, and I'm very appreciative that you guys are here to support. So uh, if no one else is here, you guys are here, and you guys are the real ones for it. So thank you. You all know who you are. Um, but yeah, I guess we can, you guys are here to hear me talk about, not my friends, but my my recent work. Um, so yeah, I, I looked, I thought about what to talk about, I mean, beyond the article and even with, I'm so glad there's a class being taught at Ryerson about this um, because there's, you know, it's very relevant right now, but also it's, it's a discussion that's needed to have been had for really years. Anyone who's ever worked in, in charity or nonprofit sectors has really known that there's, this has been an issue for a long time, but this time has really sparked discussion for a lot of different industries and now it's the charity it's now charity world's turn to have a reckoning during covid so um yeah i figured uh we can get going with the next slide but i'll before before we talk about the other stuff i'll guess i'll go through a few things on why i'm even qualified to talk about it because you're probably like who who is she anyway <laughs> so um so that picture is from one of the three trips I took with my church um, throughout the early 2000s on a mission trip that was in Swaziland. Um, and I've also been to Cuba twice um, with the church I was going to call, it was part of the church of the Nazarene designation. Um, so as part of this whole, you know, even a bit of volunteerism and whatever else, I've been part of that. Um, but I also want to be, you know, completely honest, but also at the same time, part of this is why it was, it was the beginning of my interest in um, international relations and why I wanted to do what I wanted to do. But I've always been a worldly person. I've always loved photography. I've always wondered what's going on outside of my world. And even from a very young age, my family and I have, were traveling. And so I was always wondering about, you know, I always wanted to learn about other people. And so, you know, volunteering through church and a few other organizations growing up, um, I always wanted to be able to find a way to help people. But it wasn't until I really started going on these types of mission trips that I was kind of really seeing what, you know, what the constructs of those things are um, and all those things. And really like, you know, coming from an area where, you know, it's now you realize it's colonialist and somewhat even like, and they were part of the whole church thing. So it wasn't necessarily an, um, uh, colonial that way, but in terms of like how it's structured, it could be seen as that now, you know, 2020 is hindsight, as they say. Um, but it was during these few trips that I realized that, you know, why is it up to us to help people? And even is it up to us at all? Why is it that, you know, I have to take vacation time or time off from school or I, because of where I live, like you see me, I'm a black woman living, speaking English in a, in a developed country. I literally could have been anywhere else. And so why does it take for me to be in Canada or the US or another Western developed country to be able to be seen as being able to help those who are seen as less fortunate, right? So those are the kind of seeds that really plant, that planted the seeds that really uh, got me into thinking about, you know, what charity is and who it's for and all of that. You can go to the next slide. Cool. So 
Uh, Chairtainment, like I said, has been part of my vocabulary for nearly a decade. So in 2010, um, as you can see, that I moved to Sweden to pursue a master's degree. It was a very, it's probably one of the smartest impulsive decisions I made in a long time. Uh, it was slightly done out of boredom because I was working in the financial sector, if you can believe that, um, before I left to go to school. Um, and at the time, I was still trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to do, but I knew that to really pivot, I needed to kind of up my game in terms of education. So I, at the time, Sweden was accepting international students um, on a visa agreement where you did not have to pay tuition. You just had to have enough savings in your account to be able to live for the duration of your studies. And I was like, well, okay, that's great. <laughs> um, and that's, I was like, that makes it extremely more affordable than I would have if I stayed here, ironically. So, um, so part of that time when I was there, as you see the picture there, that was um, the UN, UN Foundation has various groups and chapters in various parts of the world. So while I was in Sundsvall, which is the town that I was living in to go to school, I joined the UN Foundation there to help promote the UN's activities and awareness campaigns in various parts of the, of the country that pertain to Sweden. So it was a lot of children's stuff that we ended up doing, but honestly, it probably should have been more for UNICEF than UN, but it was a good time. And it was kind of oh, also another time to figure out, you know, what does this exactly mean in another country? What perspective do these people have on charity and why they should give and all of that? Because it really depends on the people also when you know when we're talking about charity and who it's for it also has to take on the context of where those people are giving and why they want to give in sweden it's very it's a very affluent country and at that time that i was there it wasn't it didn't always have the star system that we had over here in terms of celebrity like there were famous people like actors and things like that but they never un until recently they didn't really have like and Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt, like nothing like that would take over an entire news cycle, except for maybe the tabloids, kind of like the sun or whatever else in Britain. But it wasn't like we had it here. So this is where I, I started to learn that um, charity looks different in different places and not necessarily by the people who were giving, but also the people who were trying to organize, like trying to make people aware to care about something other than what's happening around themselves. So that was between that and my studies, which I was fortunate to be able to study with a lot of different people from each, almost each continent, um, that was super interesting. And so during that time, uh, my thesis, the idea of charitainment came about because in my studies, we were talking about, uh, we were talking about political communication. That was the main crux of our studies. And I was more interested in why celebrities were getting involved in the election. So there is an example of of Oprah Winfrey getting involved in the Obama election. And we all know who Oprah is, what she's done. We may or may not agree with what her methods are or who she involves and whatever else. But the point is she's been part of, you know, North American pop culture for decades. And she does have quite a bit of influence when it comes to various movements, especially political ones, which she had not gotten involved in before the Obama campaigns. And there is a couple of studies that had shown that even statistically, they could not prove that of her <coughs> influence into they could not prove her influence onto the campaign, which, I mean, if you know from a pop culture context, you know it's wild because this is Oprah we're talking about. If you can't prove statistically, then what's the point? And that's when I realized, I'm like, maybe this is something I want to talk about, but not necessarily in a quantitative context. For me, I've always been more towards the qualitative. And so I kind of want to change that perspective from, you know, pop culture and elections to charity, because again, at that time, I was trying to figure out what I want to be, who I want to help. Did I want to go back to charity? Did I want to work in charity? So I want to do all that. So the whole idea of charitainment, which comes from an article in Time Magazine from 2005, which Jane helped me to get to write the article. So thank you, Jane. Um, that article kind of uh, sparked, it was written at a very interesting time because it, that was the time where everyone remembers where Angelina Jolie was it's particularly trying to be um, you know, a, a great ambassador for the UN High Commission for Refugees or UNHCR. Bono was getting his campaign out. Paul Sachs was a rock star economist at that point. All of these different people were coming together to really talk about humanitarian issues abroad, not at home, but abroad. Even that should already spark uh, a discussion. So why are we looking abroad and not at home, right? But this was 15 years ago. So, and especially now we have to ask that question too, but we'll talk about that later. So the marriage of charity and entertainment in terms of the celebrity star culture that we have here merged in those times. 
it hadn't it had been around for probably since the 1950s when Danny Kay had been one of the first UN ambassadors, Goodwill ambassadors, but it hadn't really hit a fever pitch until Angelina Jolie had done it later on in the late in the early 2000s. So that spark, that moment for academia sparked a lot of thoughts, issues, and papers about how celebrity affects humanitarian involvement in charity and especially in donations and essentially world politics. So it could, there was a lot of different people that were trying to correlate the, the relationship between celebrity awareness and then actual policy that was being enacted in certain countries abroad through the charities that helped them in different places. So that was super interesting. You can go to the next slide. So eventually I had to convince quite a few people because as I mentioned, uh, in Sweden at that time, their star system was not as, you know, uh, tailored like ours is and has been for decades. So I had to convince my, my professor at the time to really, who's a, an evangel he's the son of an evangelist family. His, son's, his father is a very, uh, pro not a prominent pastor, but his family, his, he comes from the clergy. Um, so he, he has a very holistic view of things, but also is very calculating and very things. He was a great supervisor the whole time. But he, at the time, he didn't really realize why I wanted to write about, you know, uh, particular We Charity, but also just in general, why I wanted to write about how celebrities essentially through marketing and communications really affect international politics and why that needs to be more talked about because it involves just regular people. What I had to do to show him was I, I logged onto YouTube, onto We Charity's uh, YouTube website, YouTube page, and showed him a few speeches from We Day. Some of those speeches are actually still on We Charities or We, what, rather, We Movement on their YouTube today. Some of those, I used about 10 videos to make the thesis, but some of them are still on, some aren't. But I used a few of those to, con to show him. And the first thing he said to me was, this reminds me of a church rally where you're getting all types of people together to get toward a certain cause and you donate your money and your time and you're swayed by the moment and it's very charismatic. So coming from the son of a clergyman, that was super interesting. And that's where I knew I had him hooked. And I was like, well, this is what I want to write about because honestly, this in North America and honestly, at some point, the rest of the world will be like this. This is how it's going to be. This is the only way we're going to be able to get people to care about anything beyond our borders. And sure enough, I end up, uh, he gave me the go ahead and that was the start of a very grueling six months because at the time it was a brand new program and they didn't really know what, uh, how to structure the program, but luckily I finished all of it in six months. Um, but it end up, I ended up defending my thesis. Uh, I got my degree, thank goodness, because I was, certainly wasn't going home without one. And then uh, later on on the advice of a friend, uh, I entered it into a national contest that was done by a, a civil society think tank, which is unfortunately now defunct, but um, they, they read my thesis, they had, they decided that it won, and then uh, they turned it into a monograph, which is the picture you see there, um, and I got to go back in 2013 to talk about it. You can go on the next slide. Oh, actually, never mind. I realized that was an old version of my, <laughs> of my deck, but yeah, either way, I got the got the prize, all of that, and, uh, and kind of left it alone because I came back in, I came back in 2012, graduated, came back, and started, and started working, well, interning first at Journalists for Human Rights, which is a great organization, by the way, that you should follow and or support. Um, but also at the time, We Charity was, at, as they are now, were very litigious. And so anyone that raised any issue about We Charity was immediately shot down or silenced. And as someone, as a, someone who came back uh, as a very broke former student who's living at home and just trying to make a career path, I was like, I'm leaving that alone. This is, I've had my run, this is great, let me leave it alone. So we fast forward to eight years later and we have a problem. <laughs> so we can go to the next, uh, go to the next slide. So uh, this is the combination of many years of investigative reporting, mostly by Canada Land, if you guys have been following them for a while, um, but uh, they had a lot of those stories that came up first. It was more of a slow burn when it comes to this moment of reckoning for them, um, and everyone knows that at the end of June, early July was when, it, you know, things really, really hit the fan, and in terms of, you know, what people were kind of like, yeah, I've heard of We Charity, but I didn't know they were like this, 
So it kind of blew up because of the whole uh, Canada Student Service Benefit. Um, and actually that's how the, the Twitter thread came about. I was actually moving that day and kind of, and saw the news and kind of haphazardly tweeted, but it culminated into my work, which is the first, that's the first picture you see on the side there. Yes, we have a problem, but there are some other really great articles um, like Van Mala Supermanium's uh, article on their property holdings. Um, Amanda Maitland had a great, um, I want to say testimony in a way, because you know, she really made it seem like it. She's a very talented speaker. Um, but she was a former WE Charity employee who raised the question of, uh, raised the issue of racism at WE Charity. And then, but I think I, I include the last picture there that says, what does WE Charity actually do? Because that was always the second question I had heard you know, say, A, what's happening? And B, what do they actually do? But if you were working in nonprofit, you've known that for a long time because while, and I don't know if it was a question of jealousy, envy, you know, admiration, things like that. But if you work in charity, you know that it's always hard to get a market share of people's attention, donations, time, talents, whatever. We always seem to do that. We charity always seem to do that effortlessly. To the you know to the chagrin of many charities who had very talented people but could never quite get the the attention of young people which is the holy grail of any mark to any type of marketing like they did and so this time brought a lot of things in terms of uh you know where are we at now with the charity as aspect of course you know we charity having shut down its 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 canadian wing of operations is super interesting and was a surprise to me um, but know that that's not the end and we need to keep asking questions. But the more important thing that I've realized in talking with various people after, um, after my Twitter thread and after and the, the constant slew of great articles and fantastic reporting, and then um, after the article I wrote and a few others wrote, um, I've really realized that there needs to be a reckoning in charity in terms of where we need, to, where we've been and what's happening right now and where we need to go from here. So that's what I'm gonna go through. So we'll go to the next slide. So in general, as a result of the, as a result of the WE scandal, um, there was a couple of surveys that had gone out. I believe this one's from Angus Reed, And this one had asked in the past six months, has your charitable giving changed? What is more um, important to me as a marketer, but in general, and even as, to, as people who who poll like pollers always look for a couple of things we need to know where the middle is so or at least if there's a drastic change great but we also need to know where the middle is so for the majority of people it, it's giving the same or has not changed but the most important thing is the 37 percent where it, it actually is significantly lower mostly because of a combination of things where people have lost their jobs people um, are trying to refocus their finances People are just trying to, people are honestly their own charity cases. And so trying, the idea of trying to help someone else right now is not necessarily a malicious one in terms of not deciding to help anyone. It's just, I just need to feed my own kids. I need to keep a roof above my own head, never mind everyone else's. Um, but it seems like a lot of people have been giving less. And I honestly think the We Charity scandal has kind of brought the for, to the forefront a lot of issues that have been brewing in charity for a long time. They may have been, they may have started the discussion but they're not the only reasons for it. So we'll go to the next slide. And so all of that really leads us to whose charity is it anyway? Why are we doing charity? Who is it for? Who does it benefit? And what exactly can we do to kind of help charities get better at what they do? Because as much as I love charities and love working in them, I end up leaving the charity industry mostly because a, you know, I wasn't being compensated well for my skills, but also, you know, as a black woman working in a predominantly white industry, there are some of those issues as well. But in general, this, all of these things affect the people that charities serve in their mandates and their missions. And I think there's, you know, all these things are discussions that we need to have. So we'll go to the next slide. So there's three parts I'm going to be talking about. So in general, I'm saying the charity system is broken. It's not, not beyond repair. And I'm, I'm, confident of that because I, I still very much believe in charities. I, if, if you walk away with nothing else today, I want you to know that I still believe in charities and what they do and their work is very important. But there are a few reasons why they're, that's important now more than ever. So the first reason, we'll go to the next slide and then we'll come back, Jocelyn. Um, next slide first. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so a lot of ch charities have changed 
society has changed, especially in the last 20, you know, 20 to 30 years where, yes, we've, you know, we've made leaps and strides in terms of, you know, technology and things like that. But I don't know if you've noticed, but at least in Toronto, there is less and less housing. We are in a housing crisis. There's an opioid crisis. Um, there is a food, not necessarily a food shortage, but there certainly is a shortage of people who are able to feed themselves daily. And so I feel like that, unfortunately, and with governments having downloaded a lot of their responsibilities, financial and otherwise, um, to charities, that's unfortunately become a way for them to really, you know, be stressed with just doing the day to day and not necessarily promoting what they're doing so that they can eventually get more money. So as you see there, Canada currently, at least according to the 2018 census, has 86,000 charities, which is wild to me because I never thought there was that. There's always a lot, but I never thought there were that many. But many of them are just working hard to replace, honestly, the job that governments used to do. And unfortunately, that means that a lot of them are busy just trying to serve people in their community for immediately and not really thinking about sustainable future projects or things like that and how they can help their people. So that's been unfortunate with, you know, um, government kind of downloading their responsibilities onto municipalities and municipalities um, download it to the charities. So they're doing a lot more work than they, maybe more than they anticipated in some cases. And some are doing it very well and others are struggling and that's just how it is. Um, and then the second thing is that society needs have changed. Like I said, we're in various types of crises. Um, there are more, now we're at the point in Toronto at least where, you know, 60% or more of people who live in this city aren't from here or at least have parents that weren't born here. And so with that comes a lot of different various perspectives and things like that. And, you know, a lot of the times charities don't move fast enough to address those. And that's really unfortunate because just because you come from somewhere else and you don't have the, even just the idea of Canadian experience. Uh, is still, you know, in some ways <laughs> quite racist because when you come here, and unless it's like a medical thing or something like that where you have to retrain, but in general, if you were in business somewhere else, there's no reason why you have to be, you know, on assistance or being able to be helped by charity here. Um, and so, unfortunately, the system isn't set up to help people out that might need it, but then, yeah, because government's less involved, the mission to charities have changed, their needs have changed, but a lot of charities, unfortunately, have not moved along with that change. And so, unfortunately, sometimes it ends up being where people, the potential to serve isn't there or it's not met quite enough. Um, we'll go back to the next slide for the next point, or we'll go back to the previous slide for the next point. So the next second thing is, are we truly helping anyone or making things worse? And honestly, that's more of an I don't know question. It's more of a rhetorical question for all of you. Um, I still, like I said, there's a lot of charities that are doing some great work, but because between COVID, um, you know, less funding from people, all of those things, while we have been helping people and while things have been running along for a long time, this pandemic has made things, you know, really put things in perspective for a lot of people. And I feel like with charity work and all of that, a lot of charities are, have been doing charity for the sake of being, do, thinking they're doing good, but who are you really helping? Are you just raising money? Are you actually impacting someone's life? It's really made a, a, a refocus thing necessary for who's doing what. Um, and the last thing with um, the way that I see the charity system is broken within charities, because I've worked in them, is that fundamental changes in how they operate, but especially marketing, have to be made. So I'll use an example in terms of like, so there's a really great TED Talk that was done in Unionville last year by, I believe, the director of marketing for the Ronald McDonald Charities. And she had a really great point on how, you know, with donors, uh, with charities, there's a bit of a stigma in terms of how donors, um, you know, they don't want to see, they want to see their money go right to the cause, but they somehow in terms of operating, marketing is seen as an operating cost. But I feel like in terms of that, it needs to be shown differently because if you don't use marketing, you're able to, you can't reach as many people than you can with just, you know, with just the traditional forms where it's like direct mail and some email and email campaigns are very successful, but you pair that with social, with paid social media posts, other things like that. And you're able to reach more and you get more back. Um, unfortunately, marketing is seen as an overhead cost. So a lot of donors don't really want it. And it's lumped all into one thing. So a lot of donors are just like, okay, I want to see my money being going to help, you know, build this building or support this program or whatever else. But unfortunately the way that, um, 
you know, the donor committees work sometimes is that they don't really um, take all that into account and why sometimes they use it as an excuse to not put the money into marketing. It's why a lot of charities still don't have a marketing staff, except for maybe one person, but one person can't do everything, even though in a lot of instances I did <laughs> for some charities. Um, but the fundamental changes in how they, and, but even in terms of how they operate the board of directors, who's on the board of directors? Is it all white women? Is it all old white men? Do the board of directors really, you know, they are, they're the boss of the CEO. And so the decisions always come from the top, but if you don't have a diversity of thought and really perspective and all of that, then it's really not gonna trickle down. And that's another, that's another way that unfortunately the system is broken where you don't even have the people in place to be able to really think about how, you know, a photo might be seen as, you know, colonialist or ableist or things like that. Even just in the way you portray people that you're helping, it may be benign, but unfortunately it may not be effective in that way and people might be turned off and not, do, and not donate to you. So go to the next, uh, I think two slides are, are good, the next two. Uh, not that next one. I was gonna. I explained it. Yeah. So in terms of marketing, I just wanted to show a couple of examples of really successful uh, campaigns. The top one is Sick Kids, and which I'm sure everyone has seen. Um, and they've gotten some pro bono help, I believe, from an ad agency. It's probably one of the better ones I've seen in a long time, just because a they treat it, I, the, for me, it's it's the best one I've seen because they treat it like how I've seen it in the ad agency world, in that it's really a 360 campaign. They've definitely put the money into TV, digital, um, mailing, emails, and then social media as well. It's all, there's all, all of those things come into play, and even billboards. Like, even though I'm a Sick Kids beneficiary, like I spent a lot of time at Sick Kids myself as a child, and I want to give back because, hey, you know, they helped me out, I'll give them some money. But at the same time, uh, they want to be able to affect those people that almost probably have nothing to do with, with Sick Kids. And so this is where they know that they have to get the people in the middle so that they are able to convince them to come over to the side and, you know, and donate their money. And so using great photography, great video tactics, very strong messaging and positioning, they've been able to keep themselves, you know, not only afloat, but thrive. The Sick Kids Foundation raises millions of dollars a year. And honestly, I really believe that's because of their excellent marketing campaigns. A couple others down here you see are, so that's from Charity Water's Instagram. I'm not sure if you heard of Charity Water, but if you have, if you haven't, I actually suggest going to their Instagram. Their mandate is very simple, just to get clean water to the people that need it. But the way that they do it, and honestly, they're probably a banner example for a lot of marketers in the charity industry, and in that their photography and portrayal of the people that they help is not necessarily with a white gaze. Um, and I, I actually used that as an example when I was at UNICEF, because that was part of my job to kind of curate some photography and all that. You want to be able to, people, be able to show people in their, in their habitat how they really are, but still have that kind of donor edge to be able to pull at your heartstrings and be able to, to donate. But they don't portray it in such a way that it's, it's, it's a poverty porn, as, as we like to call it. So I always have liked Charity Water's portrayal of how they do it because they're just like, and it's very simple messaging. And then of course their call to action or CTA is just say, hey, go to this website, go to whatever and, and donate. But you get the incentive through their very visual and very honestly, very honest, uh, portrayal of what their work does because honestly it could be a very you could do it very complex way but it's as simple as their mission to get clean water to people that need it and they do that very well they just do one thing very very well the next one over here with the two boys bumping elbows at the first day of school that's in palestine that's actually unicef um and you know full disclosure i did work there for a while but part of one of my favorite things working there was just the plethora of content that they had to potentially use. Everyone who works in the system has access to a database with millions of pictures, videos, whatever else um, that you can use and adapt for your own country's needs. But I always felt that UNICEF has always done well, A, because I mean, they've been doing it for 70 plus years, but at the same time, they also distill their mission very well in terms of just like, hey, we're helping kids. This is how we're helping kids in this part of the country, in this part, in this part of the world, here, here, here. And those are just like, we're portraying these things here and that's why you should be able to help us. They're just showing like, this is where your money is going when you donate. And also that, that's all people want to know. They just keep it very, very simple. The last one, of course, 
is from We Movement's page uh, on their Instagram. That's a snippet from We Day. That's Selena Gomez. Um, but one thing I have admired about We Movement slash We Day, and probably the reason why a lot of nonprofit folks have have always kind of secretly admired them too, is because they have always been able to get who they need in the right moments at the right time. Even before We Day really blew up on social media, um, they got with the right media partners with CTV and Bell Media in terms of, prog um, terms of program their stuff and really broadcast the message. But also they managed to get people who appealed both to kids in that age and to adults that were likely accompanying them to those things. So in their first, the first We Day happened in 2005, I believe. And at the time they had Hanson, who was still make, who was kind of making a comeback at the time. They had Romeo Dallaire, who had just had his shake hands with the devil made into a book, I believe. And then um, a few others, including Justin Trudeau, who was then a private citizen. Um, but they were all salient people to various swaths of people they were trying to get to at the same time. And I have always admired them for that because in terms of their, their marketing and who they want to target, it's been very clear in terms of who they want to get to motivate you to donate to them. What hasn't been clear is why they need you to donate this money. That's the unfortunate thing. And I think that's what's followed them slowly for all these years, but kind of blew up in the last few months is that what do they actually do anyway? They have all these glitzy things and whatever else. And, uh, but now they, there's like, okay, well, now what do we do? And unfortunately, now that reckoning has come. I'm going to go to the next slide. So what are we learning right now? Um, so the first thing I'd, I'd say is giving and the business of it needs to change. Um, mostly because I feel like we've been doing the same thing for a long time. Anytime you, if you've worked in a nonprofit, you may have encountered a situation where you may have a really cool idea. It might be small, it might be revolutionary, who knows, but either way, it might be just a little different from the way things are done. And you may get either nicely or otherwise a, reject, uh, a rejection because it's the way we've always done it. It's always some type of variation of that where it's the way we've always done it. This has always worked for us. Um, you know, we don't want to risk our donor base. Let's just keep going this way because it, we have proven things that it works for us. And while I'm all about patterns and all of those, those things, the reason why so many of the newer charities and that are smaller, by the way, end up doing better is because they're able to to identify their needs as they're being met, but also and to identify new things that are happening and really move along with it. Um, and of course, you, you'll always have your high donor dinners and things like that. But also, I would love to see things make be a little more accessible in that sense where people are able to come to a gala dinner, even if they're not paying $10,000 a table. Um, there, there's been a change in that where, you know, for example, Journalists for Human Rights and Action for Hunger have their gala dinners, but then they also have an after party function where it's mostly geared to younger professionals. You pay say 30 to $50 um, for a few hours and you go, you have cocktails, you have drinks, whatever else. It's basically a party for a cause. Um, and even then sometimes you might be like, you know, is this actually really helping anybody? But in terms of making things accessible, it's a, step in, it's a step in the direction of like trying to make it more accessible. And so I would love to see more of that and things like that. It would, be, it would be really, really cool to see more people giving on their terms and not necessarily in the way of, you know, the old archaic ways of we have the high donors, we take their, they take their money and we let them see the sites. Why not be able to have people who give consistently $10 a month, why not be able to give them an opportunity to, to see what people are doing and how people have been other than just giving them pens or giving them a brochure, let them see the work that's been happening. But that's, that's a job of social media too. Not everybody can be on, you know, on site, especially now during COVID, right? Um, the second thing is with white supremacy, white, term, white supremacy and a moment of racial reckoning. So I already talked about Amanda Maitland's experience with We Charity, but I feel like there's been a really, I mean, there's been a reckoning of, of racial revolution in almost every industry from restaurants to business to whatever else. But for charity, um, it's unfortunate where, you know, in a couple of organizations I've been in, uh, as a creative who's been on more of the, you know, PR slash marketing communication side, I tend to be in the minority there, not just because I am an actual minority, but there's not many of us on one side of the office where it's very white collar, you know, there's research, there's development, there's philanthropy, there's PR and communications, there's IT. And then on the other side of the floor, 
you that's where you see most of most folks of color but unfortunately they're the ones on the phones they're the ones in customer service they're might even and and they're the ones who are on the entry level stuff when it comes to a charity i would love to see more of that merged and i think it's really because unfortunately i mean it's a lot of different things that manifest in charity business but uh you know i'm tired of being the only one or one of many of one of very few and i feel like with um you know unfortunately the effects of white supremacy whether it's from the board of directors from above or decision makers who don't necessarily see it for anyone else but themselves or their own people even just the way they hire people you know you'll have people that are very very experienced in general but because they know the boss's daughter or know this cousin or whatever else they'll bring somebody in and don't get me wrong it's hard for a lot of recruiters to do their jobs if they they ask for their network and honestly there's nothing wrong with that but if if it ends up being the same way where you end up seeing a lot of young white women coming in where there's other when there's plenty of others who have may not necessarily have the degree experience but certainly have the life the life experience or even just a, a certification rather than a full degree it's you know even just diversifying the idea of having a degree to work in somewhere that's also classist elitist and slightly racist so even just the way that we hire the way that we administer our programs um i feel like that needs to change and unfortunately before you do that you need to reckon with you know especially for white folks in the charity business what do i need to do to give my platform to someone else how can i give the mic to someone else how can i listen more how can i act on their behalf and it's not just being an ally where you're posting a photo or things like that and you just go about your day no you're actually continuing the actions of consistently asking if you're in a like one of my current coworkers is great in that she constantly asks me what i think about something and her just passing the mic to me to be able to express my opinion without it necessarily being asked means that you know hey her her opinion's important she's in the room not only is she in the room but she's contributing and i feel like that needs to happen in many other workplaces but especially charity because unfortunately we're often seen as the ones being helped but not not being talented enough to be to be the ones to help right and then that goes that also goes of course to volunteerism which is one thing that we charity and many other organizations by the way it's not just them have been known for over the years and uh i'm not sure if you guys have seen the we have you seen mark um i don't know it's craig kilberger's MTV Cribs video from the early 2000s where he tours one of one of his uh one of the We Charity houses where volunteers go to stay. If you haven't seen that, please google it. Please go on YouTube and watch it. It is the most cringe tastic thing you will ever see in your life because to me that is the epitome of like white saviorism, volunteerism and supremacy all in one. It's just this random white guy in the middle of Kenya with this gorgeous house um that is unlike anything that the people would who actually live there live in so he's going through going through all these modern things whatever else think of it as the ultimate airbnb but like maybe 10 years ago and uh yeah he's going through the motions and say, and also promoting the programs that the volunteers do but you just i don't know i was if you had a mirror on me when i was watching it the first time i was just biting my nails cuz like this is so cringe worthy oh my god um but it at this but the only people of color and black folks you see in there are the ones who are helping are the ones who are helping out run the place they're not necessarily even the charity workers or anything else they're the ones who are helping just to run the house and so i it's it's the ultimate like it's the epitome of white saviorism because you came into someone else's country imposed your thing on them and hit and say this is what's good for you i am here not having no background in international relations having no background in politics maybe i did a course at a university not to see why i see 550 500 not to knock on you you know you guys are here for a reason but you know just because you took one class doesn't mean you get to go over and help somebody else you actually have building certifications whatever else one of the things that um from my swaziland trip that i actually did admire because we had partnered with an american section of that church to do it is that they had various projects but they had licensed you know building people they had engineers they had plumbing people they had people who were in that profession just donating their time but really were certified people in their field to go over and build a school unfortunately and this is mostly based on um anecdotal content from people that i know who've been on the we ship trips is that most people who go they don't really build anything and sometimes they have to take it down before they build it back up for the next people 
So that's unfortunate. Um, and the last thing is that, like I said, there's still some good happening in charities, but they need to talk about themselves more. And I feel like that's, um, it might even, I don't even want to say it's gender based because I mean, a lot of one transition I noticed hugely when I went from charity to corporate was that, um, you know, corporate is male dominated. They're, you know, it's, it's very like big money, big spending. We, we break things, we break things and apologize later. We test things out. Charity is almost the opposite in that. And I'm not really going to gender it. Cause I think it's just another, it's just, uh, it's just a tendency where it's really, it's not as like, it's more just like, okay, we're going to do this thing. Let's evaluate. Let's do this first. And I agree we should, you know, evaluate and test and learn, but it's not as adventurous. And unfortunately that makes it detrimental to a lot of charities in the long run, because if we don't know what you're talking about or who you are, we can't support you. And unfortunately, and some of that is because, you know, people don't have the budget or whatever else, but, and this is more for the big charities. A lot of them, are underserving themselves when it comes to promoting their own work because they, um, they're just not spending, they're just not investing in it enough. And so if I want to be able to donate to you, I need to know what exactly are you doing with my money? What, who is being helped? Who is making the decisions and all of that? But that's easy for you to do if you have nothing really to hide or if it's clear enough, it should be almost boring if you're gonna show me that. But also it's why, you know, marketing is, social marketing is especially important now because I still see it as very accessible. And that's why, honestly, I'm still in it because it's a way for me to help others join in and really reap the benefits because there's still a lot of benefits to be had through social media. We can go to the next slide. Oh, good, next one. I guess it loaded wrong. Oh, uh, just, to, just to, this is from another TED Talk I was watching about volunteerism. Um, and, and really, it's why volunteerism should not exist. If you don't have the time to learn about a place or an issue, why do you think they have the time to solve the, the right to solve it or go there to make it better? So um, in my thesis, I talked about an instance called ironic solidarity. It's probably one of my favorite academic terms because it's uh, almost like the, a term called pathetic fallacy in writing. But anyway, so when you are motivated to do something as a collective, Ironic solidarity basically means that you're only really acting in your self-interest. And the irony of acting in that self-interest is that you're not really helping the other person that you've been motivated to help. You're only really helping yourself, but not in a way that you're like, oh, I, you know, charity, helping others does make us feel good. There is actual studies for this. But in terms of things like a media event, like We Day, where you're motivated because this celebrity, that person, that random guy who you kind of see on TV, but you don't really know, they made you feel good. You get a whole bunch of goodies and all those things. And you're like, okay, well, and then you get this message packed into it where to say, you feel good now. And now we're going to spread that love to other people. But you're not really doing that because you were motivated by a whole bunch of glitz and glamour and all of that. And not necessarily because you know what the situation is and that how you're going to help the other person. So that really explains ironic solidarity. Acting, acting kind of as a group, um, as part of a collective, but really acting in your own self-interest and not for the better. So that's unfortunate. And go to the next slide. Oh, right. And then I did talk about the anti-racism stuff at uh, uh, We Charity. But like I said, there needs to be a reckoning that way in terms of racial uh, tension and strife in the charity world. We can go to the next slide. Ah, so where do we go from here? Uh, so there's a lot of things, but I think for me right now, there are these three things. Um, so yeah, like I said, charities need to reflect the society and needs that they serve inside and out. So hire people, um, of, and don't just use diversity as a keyword. I'm tired of hearing, I must, that's, it's almost, diversity is almost becoming a word that I put with synergy and I think it's almost become pointless <laughs> when I don't want it to become pointless. Diversity really means diversity of thought, race, sexual orientation. All of those things do matter because they provide a perspective how you know, how we live. And especially in a city like Toronto, where we say, you know, diversity is our strength. They love saying that, but then the way they actually act through policy and all of that, it still only benefits mostly white folks, unfortunately. But I feel like what well, charities can kind of counter that and how they serve, rad be radically inclusive. And not just because you're a charity like Rainbow Railroad that already by its very existence is radical, but even something as benign as the United Way, where you're just like, you have people who are serving on boards who are managers, who are all of that, who are, I'm seeing that I want to see different people 
and various ends of the spectrum. I really, that's, I think even just, just having the idea that, you know, be radically inclusive in who you, who you recruit to help people out. And honestly, more people, especially in the field and having been in the field myself, people are more willing to accept you if you look like them. This works within marketing and all of that too. People are more responsive to things where it looks like them. And I think that's because like, you know, we want to be able to relate to people as human beings. But unfortunately, in the media, a lot of things are even just you know, today in Canadian media, especially it's very white. But we want to be able to have just being able to see like, hey, this person is working at, um, I remember one time I had gone with the YMCA, I had gone to um, a, a, a youth project in Regent Park. And it was really cool. And the girls were actually surprised to see me because they're like, are you like a social worker or anything? I was like, no, no, I'm just, I'm on the marketing team. I'm just here to document and ask you questions and things. They were like, and immediately they started asking me, how did you do this? What did you do to get there? What kind of thing did you study? Do you like it? Are you on Facebook all the time? Just like, and they were just so interested in whatever I did because they're just like, oh, this is possible. I just, I'm able to, you were here and this is possible. And I want to see more of that. I really do want to see more of that. Uh, the second thing, transparency, transparency, transparency. And of course there's, you know, to me, it's like, you need to demystify. A lot of things have been demystified this year. And I really feel like charity work needs to be among that too. I don't just want to believe that my 20 bucks is just poof gone somewhere. And hopefully it helps a young person that shows up in an image I see on social media. I want to be able to follow the money. I want to be able to see, um, you know, give me a couple stories and who helps. But even, even if you want to, you should be able to just call up the charity and have someone talk to you about what's happening. I think there's a lot of, we, because we rely on a lot of us like, you know, marketing and brochures and things, unless you're a high value donor, you don't get to talk to the charity. And I actually think that's a problem. Um, I would love to see just more middle income, low income, as long as you're a donate, uh, as long as you're interested in, um, in donating your time, money or talents or otherwise, you should be able to have a direct line with the charity. I don't think it's very fair that it, that only that that honor only gets to be high value donors. I shouldn't be able to give you ten thousand dollars, and that's the only way I really know what you're doing. That's not fair, because um, like I said, the majority of charities rely and operate on people who consistently give smaller amounts every month. Why don't they get anything more than a pen, right? Um, the other thing is with transparency is that with various watchdogs like um, you know Charity Watch and things like that, like Kate Ban and and Mark Bloomberg have been excellent uh, resources on this, especially in the last few months. But they've really brought to the forefront that even charities need watchdogs to really figure out, you know, to have some transparency, but also have accountability into where they're going. And, you know, with We Charities um, uh, reckoning moment too, that and that's where the crux of it was. You know, we want to be able to see where the money goes. Why is it going to real estate and not people? Why can't we see where it goes in me to we? And it's not necessarily wrong to have a for-profit and a non-profit arm. Banks do this all the time. Like TD has Friends of the Environment Foundation, their Reading Club, all of that. Those are non-profit arms for a for-profit business. But as long as you're able to separate them and have those entities being able to be checked out, that's no problem. The problem is when you have things convoluted. Um, and I would suggest uh, basically following anything Kate Bain says, because she's actually a very brilliant lady. <laughs> um, I got the pleasure of meeting her uh, a few weeks ago online, and she's, she's very brilliant. I would suggest following her on Twitter, but also reading um, any of her articles, what she does. And Mark Bloomberg as well is, is a very good subject um, expert on that. The last thing is open your purse. Um, those of you who are well-versed in meme culture will know exactly which meme I'm referring to. But uh, with open, opening your purse, especially if you're a government or a corporation, I did mention earlier about how governments have downloaded a lot of responsibility um, and not necessarily more money to the charity business. And I know that there was a, a, a petition to, um, from various charities, there were various signatories, to get the government to help them out. Because of COVID, unfortunately, they're lose, there's something about like $6 billion lost um, as a result of COVID and maybe even the WE scandal. And so as a result, some charities have banded together to lobby the government to be able to give them more support so that they can keep serving their communities because they're honestly losing so much money. So I would love to see some of that responsibility put back on the government to be able to A, provide like accountability, but also provide support where it's needed. 
and not necessarily when they need to quickly get out a student program that wasn't really well thought out and honestly no charity would have done right never mind me charity um and then if you're a corporation of course like i said banks have charity for charity arms of all the time but i would like to see more donations from um from corporations go to the even the smaller organization because a lot of the times you get your ymcas your un your um, united nations your united way um but i would love to see it go to smaller charities that don't always get that i was talking to someone um of a an executive director of a charity the other day and he mentioned that they, some, in some cases, they are too small to even get municipal support because their their volunteer base, their donor base, and their staff, which is basically one, is too small to even receive support. Why is that the case? I always found that very weird. In that, you know, no matter as long as you're you you're registered, you have volunteers, whatever else, you have a mandate, and you have the paperwork to back it up, you should be able to get support from your local government. It is our tax dollars at work anyway, and I don't see why that shouldn't be. The case to be able to help get help when you need it so that you're able to you know help other people um but go to the next slide there's another way i think we can also go from here and that's the donors that's us so i think the onus is on us too to really hold charities accountable because at the end of the day we can't just i think we should treat them more like businesses in the way that you know we hold them accountable to things we want to know where our money's spent and we want to know that they reflect our values so you know, you ask yourself questions such as how much of a difference can I make and not necessarily through your money. Of course, you know, any charity would love to get your money, but at the same time, they can use your talents, they can use your networks, they can use, um, you know, networks to bring in other people from, you know, your world or wherever else, you can use your own talents, but even just sharing a post is sometimes just as effective as paying money because reach is so important and I'm definitely living proof of that. Where and where does my money go? So you want to have an annual report. But like I said, if we have more of a two way communication between the charity, if I wanted to talk to someone at the YMCA, I should be able to pick up the phone and be like, can I talk to someone in this department about this? Where does my money go? I want to be able to get more explanation. But that's more, you know, that's easier said than done because it's not the way it's currently set up. But I'd love to be more of a two way communication between charities and and donors. But also, is this organization meeting its meeting its goals and mandate and how so again with the the we charity scandal kind of brought that to the forefront of that a do we actually know what they really do b how do you track impact tracking impact is super super important for any charity because that's the basis for getting more or less donations sometimes from the government itself i think the failure with um we charities reporting in that you know tra tracking tracking impact is that sometimes they counted like an action such as a kid writing a letter as an action towards something that happened in one of their places. And unfortunately, that's not good enough. <laughs> um, but tracking impact is super important and there should be a way for for donors, big and small, to really um, come to terms with that. You know, the next slide. So I'll use myself as a last example before I close. Um, so in terms of, you know, donations and what can you do, um, back in June, so my birthday is in June, as you, my name probably indicates, um, that was at the peak of, you know, um, the beginning of the, after George Floyd died, was murdered by the police, um, you know, huge reckoning and just, if you were Black, honestly, it was just, you were just feeling very low and yet we are still expected to show up to work and meetings like nothing was wrong. Meanwhile, you have this existential dread. And so usually what I was, you know, kind of not feeling great, but then I was like, well, what can I do? I feel helpless, but I was like, wait, I'm still thankfully working. I, I'm okay enough to be able to maybe donate some money to someone else, but also I want to be able to, you know, I know that charities are the ones that are helping people right now, but also in addition to that, we have, you know, caremongering, white people call that caremongering, but if you've read an article about um, uh, mutual aid by Vicky Machama, in the walrus an excellent article um we have like when i say we i mean black folks we've had those types of networks forever as long as i can remember if you know what a susu is you know what i mean so i would suggest reading that article in some other ways that people are helping others directly even without charity and i do mention this at the end of my flare article and that some of the rigid rigidities of large organizations prevent real change from happening right now because someone's just like i just need to have food in my belly today my ODSP check is a couple days late. 
does someone have something to tide me over? And then you pay that forward to somebody else. There's a great Facebook group, a care monitoring group on Facebook about this. But as for me, I was like, okay, well, I have, I'm still working and I still have a little bit of money to spare. Um, and I have a pretty good social network across, you know, various countries and everywhere else because of where I've been. Why don't I help use that network and funding to be able to help smaller charities in Toronto and across the country that are black owned, black facing or black serving. And so um, I, my usual birthday celebration is called 30 days of June. It is a real hashtag I made for myself and that I use to, to organize parties for different groups of friends I have throughout the month of June. But for this particular year, every day I promote on my Instagram various um, charities, big and well, mostly small, smaller ones, but I had certain ones that were about health, were about youth, were about art, um, were about history, especially history societies um, that were black serving, black owned or um, black facing. And I had friends in the States donate, um, friends here donate, friends from overseas, like in Europe donate. I'm pretty sure, like I did the tally the other day, I'm pretty sure it was upwards of a thousand dollars in change that we raised because it was all small donations that end up being a, a large thing. Um, so whether you use your own network or using your own talents, your time and your money, that is one way we can still help each other. Um, but I think in the charity world, we need to realize that people are doing this more now and that they're moving, people are moving towards nimbler, nimble solutions that can help people right away. But I still think charities are very necessary because they're, most times they're able to look at the bigger picture of things because they have access to various government data and government databases and things like that. And so they're able to see the bigger picture of what can happen for the future. And so I think those things working in tandem where we've really realized that we need to help each other out even more now. We can't really act individually anymore. Um, but also with charities, charities need to have that mindset too where you know, they've been acting independently for a long time. It might be time to pool some resources with other charities. Um, like I said, 86,000 charities. I, as much as I love to see that much, I also am like, I feel like there could be some efficiencies where maybe, you know, a few can merge and pool their resources, talents and whatever else and be even more effective to reach even more people. So those are some things I think that we can do to look towards the future of giving. Um, because like we said, we're, you know, you can't be traditional anymore in terms of how things have always been. A TV campaign can't always work anymore because a lot of people aren't watching TV, they're streaming or they're on their phones. They're not necessarily, some people don't even own a television. I have cable for the first time in my life in my name. I have never had that and I'm 37 years old. So some of the traditional stuff is not gonna work on me, but a social media post might. So things like that are, are things I, I feel like charities need to be able to recognize and move towards, especially now that you know, a lot of people, a lot more people are in need, but I feel like there needs to be a multidisciplinary approach to how that can happen. Um, you can go to the next slide. Ah, and so with that, I say charities and nonprofits uh, have to fundamentally change the way, the way they do good in order to continue. Because ultimately, I believe that a charity's ultimate goal should be to put itself out of business. Um, and at the end of the day, donors, which is us, we need to hold ourselves accountable, hold ourselves, but also charities accountable, but also being conscious about why we give, not necessarily how much, whatever else, but why are we doing it? Am I doing it because a celebrity told me to? Am I doing it because uh, I see someone in my network that is in need? Am I helping out because right now it's a cool thing to do and I want to post on social media and look like I'm okay and then just not do it again? You have to really look at why you're giving in order for it to be effective. And so that's, that's all I have to say. I mean, that's a lot, but uh, I, I thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. I'm especially active on Instagram and Twitter. Those are my two favorite platforms anyway. I am on some of the others, but I'm more of a lurker there. I'm way more active on Twitter. So uh, I would suggest you join me there. And then if you want a copy of my thesis, my original thesis, not the book, I have a Patreon for that. So you can join that. And then, uh, yeah, we can also um, connect via LinkedIn, of course, too. I will have a website soon, but it's been super busy and I haven't had a time to uh, <laughs> finish that, but I'll get to it soon. It's funny. I have so much time to create stuff for other people, but for yourself, you know, it's a bit more difficult. But thanks. Let's answer some questions. I want to see what people are asking.
Thank you, June. That was wonderful. I was writing down lots of notes of different themes that we've been talking about in class so far, things like the, the white savior complex and how do we track impact and I was particularly gratified that there was a few comments about um, things that that the students have had to read so the, the that mention of the MTV the crib um, yeah. that, that, that very cringeworthy movie that's that's in one of their readings and then they were supposed to listen to Kate Bahan uh, on the current just before oh. just before our session so yeah that's great we didn't plan that I promise okay <laughs> so <laughs> we have lots of so we, so we had some questions come in um, during during your lecture um, we also uh, ahead of time I asked the students um, after reading your article if they had any questions for you so um, we've got a few of those and I want to make sure that we get to everything so I, it's 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 um, it's 408 so I'm cognizant of the time um, okay. there was a question that came in from Sweden so I have a feeling that's maybe someone that you know so I definitely want to give that it's due so it's in the chat and it's from someone named Nathan in Sweden okay and so Nathan asks I'm what good. is your greatest fear when it comes to how charity industry system works they're increasingly for-profit setting or the way a charity distributes its donation if it happens to be the former any other setting framework you would think of such as more of a government-based charity okay. Yeah, I think um, my greatest fear, I, I wouldn't say fear, but maybe concern. Um, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily scared of the for-profit stuff. I, in terms of marketing, I actually think charity should act like, like for-profits that way. I did mention that with the, the sick kids thing. Um, but maybe the charity, the way the charity distributes its donation, that's always more of my concern in general because we need to know where the money's going. I need to know you know, how much is going to overhead and really break down that overhead too. I think, like I said, a lot of the times you just kind of lump every, as long as it's not with like, as long as it has to do with operations and nothing else, it's just lumped in. Um, so yeah, I would say my, more of my concern is how a charity distributes its donations. Um, but yeah, the for-profit thing, there are some tendencies I think charity needs to steal from that world. Um, so I'll take a question. I'll, I'll ask a question from one of the students now. Um, mm -hmm. So one question was, do you think youth or teachers who attended the We Day events could now have a different outlook on their experience with all this new information brought to light? How do you think people are feeling about the experiences that they've had? It really depends. And I have friends who have worked for We Charity in camps and things like that. But I also have quite a few teacher friends. And for the majority of them, they always had a bit of a nagging feeling that something wasn't quite right, um, especially because the curriculum was almost forced on them. So you don't really have, a ch as long as the school board decides that we are doing this part, you will teach this part as part of your curriculum for the year, they don't have a choice. And so they're already like, well, I have to teach this stuff, but great teachers will take that in their stride and, and do what they have to do because they want kids to learn they're great teachers. Um, but most of most of my teacher friends anyway always had a bit of a nagging feeling about what exactly was happening there and for those that um, that were you know of course you're gonna have uber fans that might have a reckoning right now and so I think it's more just like blissful obliviousness in terms of like hey you know at least the kids are out of school they get to learn how to help others which is true but in what context and why why is this why is it happening this way why is it, why are they being handed swag bags from corporations that almost well we think have nothing to do with international relations but ultimately do because they might be like drilling or things like that um just the exposure of various things like i get that the idea in itself is great in terms of like you get out of the classroom you get into the real world and you need some and because they're teenagers you need to get you know something out of it too because no one will do anything for nothing but at the same time i think the teachers in this respect most of them always were a bit suspicious of the whole thing in general. Great, thank you. Um, uh, a question from the chat um, was, uh, when you say charity business, quote unquote, um, is it cognitive dissonant for you or cringeworthy? So I guess this is talking about the marriage of charity and business. Yeah, it's a bit of both, honestly. Because um, like I said, I, I do think there are some aspects like marketing that charity needs to take from uh, the advertising world. Um, 
but also like, yeah, the fact that it even has to become a business to become, to be even considered relevant. Yeah, I see that too. And I understand why you asked that question. It's a great question. But for me, yeah, it's a little, it's a little bit of both. And it's kind of like, I hate that it has to be business, but that's, um, at least in North America, that's the way we have to operate, unfortunately. And so to really be effective, you kind of have to play the game a bit, even by buying, you know, even buying into Facebook ads to do that. I mean, even though I kind of, and it's funny, as a marketer, I loathe Facebook, but I know it's still the most effective way to get reach, right? And so it's kind of like with charity business where it's like, yeah, you shouldn't have to resort to these types of things. But unfortunately, it's where you got to meet people where they are and where they are is, is you have to do it the same way that ad agencies do it. Maybe not with as much money, of course, but it's, it's the one thing I learned when I moved over to the ad world. I was like, why aren't charities doing this? <laughs> Those uh, tension, the tension with values is, is always an issue. Okay. I'll uh, do one more from the class. Um, this this was interesting was uh, do you think that the future of social change will move toward less structured collaborative movements operating outside of a charitable framework or do you think that some sort of organizational framework is necessary to make genuine traction or impact uh both <laughs> um so yeah, at the end i talked about you know caremongering gofund you know we've all seen gofundmes blow up in the last especially this year but in the last few years where people are like, hey, I need to get, especially for, you know, especially for uh, trans, trans folks, people of color, um, who may be falling out of the healthcare system because they need this thing done to be, you know, to complete, uh, you know, themselves. And they can't do it because it's not seen as an essential surgery. So like, okay, well, a GoFundMe and people will help them out. Or um, you have people who are just like, yeah, I, my ODSP check is short. Uh, but the government's going to take a while to fix it. But my kids need milk today. Can someone just, you know, can someone just email me a couple bucks and it'll be, and there's never like, oh, I'll pay you back. In that group, there's all, I love the sense of like, just pay it forward. I help you out. You pay it forward to somebody else. Um, and then of course, with the, the mutual aid article about um, that Vicky Machama wrote in the, in the Walrus. Um, and then with my campaign for 30 days of June. But then also, for the big policy things, there still needs to be a framework for that. And that's why I also said that government needs to get involved again with that because ultimately it is government that still creates the structure and framework of policy that implements things that prevent the situation that charities have to fulfill. Like if there wasn't a, a, a sense of like, you know, food shortage, it, there's no food, there's not a food shortage as we found out like how the food system really works. But why is it that we have farmers dumping milk and people can't buy milk at the grocery store? Do you know what I mean? And that's, that's a question that only really large scale like policy things can solve. We can't solve that by ourselves. It's like trying to say, you know, you, saw, you save the environment by switching the paper straws, which are honestly the most annoying thing. <laughs> Don't use paper straws, it doesn't do anything. Maybe a metal straw, but not paper ones. It just, it just shows a whole futility in it anyway. But I do believe there needs to be a bit of both. For things that need to happen right now that we can move quickly, yeah, go help that person out. Give them a couple bucks. Uh, help them, you know, help them stay up in your house for a little bit. But for the major things, like, and that's the other thing, like, charities have been acting as a band-aid for government for so long now that it's almost gotten ridiculous. Why isn't there a case where we build a framework so that if we had enough sustainable housing, we wouldn't need to help, we wouldn't need to build more shelters because there'd be enough housing for everybody. Right. I live at Young and Eglinton and I live down the street from where the whole protest happened with the Roehampton Hotel. And it was sad to see that because I was in huge favor. In fact, in fact, of where it was, I was like, this is actually a perfect location because this area is so densely mixed with so many people from all walks of life. Why not them, too? They're a part of the society. They deserve a place to stay and to be safe. Why can't? And almost as soon as um, they got kicked out, I've immediately seen more people on the street right afterwards so okay there was a, an earlier question about um pa positions of privilege in uh nonprofits and charities but i believe that you did address that um throughout your talk and then so then a very recent question that just came in greetings from england great presentation is chair attainment mostly a north american thing or is it popular gaining popularity in other parts of the world if just north america what makes it popular there and not so much elsewhere and that's from ainsley harris 
Ainsley. Hi, Ainsley. I know Ainsley. We went to, we went to junior high together. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so yeah, so I think at first when I was doing my thesis, it was not a thing outside of North America. It was very much like the reason why the UNHCR they were pioneers in this in that they had, you know, Danny Kaye, then Audrey Hepburn. I talk about Audrey Hepburn versus Angelina Jolie, both in my article, but also my thesis. But um, it was a thing in North America because the UN was very smart in merging their vision with knowing that people here cared about celebrities enough to listen to them talk about this other thing, right? So for a long time, it was very North America only. But I believe in the 10 years since the thesis and really the 15 years since that article, it has spread to other parts of the world, even in Sweden, where remember I had to convince my professor that it was even a phenomenon because he didn't believe it. Um, but he's not so necessarily a pop culture aficionado, at least he wasn't at that time. So now they have in Sweden, for example, they have what's called um, Radio Hjelpen, which is basically like charity radio in Swedish. And they have various um, famous jockeys, like, you know, DJs and uh, jockeys from the country. And then they'll, they'll have other people host a show, they'll have celebrities host a show for an hour, and then you tune in and you do all this other stuff. So now it's a thing, but it wasn't always. Uh, the rest, in the rest, and especially with COVID now, it's been super interesting to see how that's kind of proliferated in different areas. Like, there's an excellent, um, if you're into house music, like I am, there's an excellent channel on YouTube called Boiler Room. And they typically do concerts and sessions from all over the world. What's been very cool in the last few months is that they've been able to raise thousands, maybe even millions of dollars at this, at this point by having some of their celebrity DJs do, uh, do sets where during the set, the live set, people will donate and then they might get a chance to get their song played, get a, a favorite song played or something like that, where, you know, so other countries have, have, They've been using this for a while now too, but this was ge definitely generally a North American idea first. But I think with the proliferation of Angelina Jolie being a, cele a world celebrity, but also with Bono and things like that, that's where it really started to disseminate from all over. But everyone is doing it a bit differently. But the UN, especially UNICEF, has been really good at getting various celebrities uh, from different countries to promote their causes. But it's almost to the point where it's almost benign now, where it's like, okay, they're a global ambassador, uh, what do we do now? So maybe it's been too successful in that sense. Okay, I think we're going to give the last word to the last question that I got from the class. I was so happy to see the student engagement on this. Okay. Um, and I think it's appropriate given your, your expertise and, and perhaps a positive forward looking uh, note to end on. Um, if you were to open an event for an event for social change that targets youth like We Day, yeah. how would you grab youth's attention and raise awareness without celebrity endorsement or employing a little star power? It's hard. It's very, very hard to do. Um, great question, though. Um, I feel like the, it depends on who starts it. But even just with, you know, movements have started on so, social media is the key for me, not just because I work in it, but I feel like it's been the catalyst for so many movements like Black Lives Matter, like the Arab Spring, um, like Me Too. Um, and it's mostly, at the time, at least, it's mostly, most of those movements are mostly faceless. It might have been one person who started it, but then it takes on a life of its own and whatever else. And I feel like as long as there's, you know, there's a collective of people who believe in the same thing and are able to proliferate that vision through their own networks, that's what keeps it going. And I think that's also what's made, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter stuff so interesting and very, um, and keep growing despite everything is because there's a central belief and movement, but there's not a central amount of people that are controlling it. And so that would be like, if I were to do an event, like even just with some of the protests that have been happening, you know that um, um, as long as there's a common cause for something and you're like, let's use this hashtag to organize and meet up and whatever else, that's where you can get, um, that's where you can get a, a movement going for a typical event. So even like there's different events that have been happening during COVID and they have had no celebrity involvement, maybe some local artists that people know through their networks and things like that. But I feel like there's been a lot of great events that have been happening without necessarily celebrity involvement. But the key to, the key to all of that is really a central, a core belief and goal towards something. 
and you have enough people in your network that, and you've got to be strategic about your network too. It's like, who has access to this? You pull your resources. You're like, who has access to people in government? Who has access to, you know, artists, but not necessarily like celebrities, but people who have, you know, to me, any, the core of, not the core, but a, an essential part of any movement is the artists. Cause they're the ones a, that have the time to create and be prolific with their visions, but also they're able to illustrate whatever you want to do. Um, then you have people who can capture it, like who can, who can be the photographer, videographer, who can write, who knows things about law, who knows things about permits. I think the one thing I've learned, one thing I didn't expect to learn through the last three years working in the ad business is permitting and how important that is and how producers basically run everything and how you should very respect, respect them a lot because they run everything. So even without celebrities, you definitely need a central core belief and a core movement um, toward a, a common goal. How you come about that is how you do it. But I feel like that's why movements on social have kept on for so long because um, without celebrity endorsement, it's really hard. But I think as long as you keep having those types of things, it'll keep growing. I would definitely use the Black Lives Matter movement as an example of that. That's great. Thank you so much, June. Um, Melanie, I'm wondering whether or not I should turn it over to you for some closing remarks. Absolutely. Thank you, June. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, it was absolutely wonderful. And thank you uh, so much for starting with your own personal journey and your um, introduction as how, and how you became curious uh, about celebrity involvement in, uh, in charity work. But that question of becoming curious is such an important um, opening to a journey and a life and a body of work. And so for everybody who's listening and our journeys, but is particularly important as instructors in a course with a group of students uh, to know about the importance of becoming curious about something that's, that's poking at you. Um, I loved your message of agency of um, taking time, recognizing our talents and contributions that could be made at a, at a number of levels. And um, your own personal example of 30 days in June, sort of a beautiful example of networking and innovation, so well uh, rooted in our, uh, comes to set roots in a course on social innovation. And um, it, it's so elemental to, and fundamental to uh, how we talk about social innovation. Yeah, your breadth of knowledge and commitment and deep rooted values and beliefs in social justice just permeate everything you said. And I can't imagine how we could have launched this unexpected visitor series with anyone <laughs> other than you. So thank you for taking a risk with us and uh, being game to go from a virtual classroom to the virtual university. And I appreciate that we'll be able to have a record of this talk going forward. So many thanks to you for that. Thank you so much. This is, I was going to say, this is a, a bit of a full circle moment for me because like I started this, the idea started while I was at university. Um, and it's, it's kind of a full circle moment getting to talk about it again, eight to 10 years later afterwards. So thank you for the opportunity and risk is my middle name. Like this is what we do in social. So as for taking a risk, Every day, every day, it's fine. <laughs> well, we, it's great. we will continue to loop you in, so thank you. And I want to thank everybody uh, on behalf of the Office of Social Innovation. Um, there's ways of staying in touch with us, please. Um, just going to the slide just before, uh, we have an upcoming uh, lecture in next week uh, as part of our free school where we're rethinking how we work with archives in this uh, day and age of thinking about history and who gets to tell it and how it's recorded. And Cheryl Thompson will be um, speaking about how to navigate archives when there's missing information or incorrect information. Um, so uh, please join us for that. And if you want to stay in touch with OSI, here's how. Um, through our various means of social media, please Twitter, um, Instagram, subscribe to our mailing list. And um, we hope to see you at future events. And to the students in the course, we will see you on, um, uh, on the course, on the, on the course, on, in the course on, uh, online. Okay, thank you everybody for uh, attending. Thank you again, June. Thank you everyone.